to rise, then rise, then rise some more before it dies. So its fast rise is evidence of its imminent death. That's not strength. This video is brought to you by MilesFranklin.com. If you are considering the ultimate financial insurance of physical precious metal ownership, Miles Franklin has been supplying it for the past 25 years. Rated A plus by the Better Business Bureau, it is well known for competitive prices and industry leading consumer service from brokers with on average two decades of experience. Not to mention the industry's best financial blog offered each and every day for free. Whether you aim to buy, sell, or store precious metals, Miles Franklin promises to treat each consumer like family. They can be reached online at milesfranklin.com or by phone at 800-822-8080. Hey everyone, this is Elijah Johnson with FinanceInLiberty.com and back with us today is Jim Willie, editor of The Hattrick Letter, found on GoldenJackass.com. Jim, thank you so much for joining us once again today. Pleasure to be back. Hope everybody had a good holiday break and got rested up because uh, now, comes, now comes the main storms. Definitely. You recently wrote an article titled the widespread deception and hall of mirrors and you discussed that in 2015 this will be the year when the whole system fractures and the fractures you say are going to start in february did you want to talk a little bit about that yeah um notice in the last month or more the oil price has fallen and you, know, you could say well gee that's that's because the dollar's strong or they're trying to hurt Russian income. And man, I tell you, Elijah, all, almost all of these interpretations are dead wrong. Dead wrong. They could not be more wrong. I made a forecast two years ago when it was pretty clear that, you know, zero interest rate and, and QE bond monetization is not a solution, it's a patch. I said, you're, you're going to know we're in the end game when the dollar starts rising without any real reason for doing so. The dollar is going to rise, then rise, then rise some more before it dies. So its fast rise is evidence of its imminent death. That's not strength. So we're starting to see the fractures. We're, we're seeing uh, a, a lot of problems with the... Uh, the oil price, we're hearing about how it damages Russia, but I've got a client, a very good client, who I'm in communication with regularly, and he has a son. Well, he also does some business with some Russian firms, but his son is in Moscow. So when we say, oh, the U.S. is really, really putting the punch to the gut of Russia. <laughs> Aren't we tough? No, we're not. The dollar has gone up, which means the ruble has gone down. The ruble has gone down as much as the oil price in dollar terms. Therefore, in Russian ruble terms, they have no change. We're saying that we're crippling Russia? They have no change in their ruble-based oil income. Nothing. No change. Zero. So where is the damage to Russia? Well, it's a long story, but it's in import prices. Okay, if the ruble's down, the dollar's up, therefore all the imports going up in price, whether they're euro-based or dollar-based or some other currency-based, Okay, the imports are costing more. Then the U.S. comes out with another false story saying that the Russians are using up and spending their gold reserves to manage their ruble crisis. It could not be further from the truth. What they're doing is they're converting and they're telling us what they're doing, but the U.S. press doesn't report it because it's not in sync with their propaganda. The Russians are taking all their energy and metal-based income from exports and converting it into gold. 
while they're using from their reserves treasury bonds. They're dumping their treasury bonds in order to facilitate the trade for imports. In other words, in order to subsidize possibly some of the price increases on their imports. So this son of the client said, no change for energy businesses, no change for the price of gasoline, no change for the price of heating oil, all across Russia and in particular the metro Moscow area. But more importantly, occasionally import prices do go up a little bit and they go right back down. They've got absolutely, well, I shouldn't say it, they got virtually no sharp effects that are negative, period, in Russia. The effects are felt in the United States. This has to do with the 2015 fractures. Little known to the very poorly informed American public, which I believe is very badly educated at the same time, for instance, doesn't speak a foreign language, the problems are escalating. We've got $2 trillion worth of oil industry shale-related bonds. That's maybe three times as much as the mortgage subprimes. Now, remember the Lehman Brothers event that we had in 2008? Remember all the different aftershocks rel related to that 2008 incident? I won't go into the details of it because it really was a Goldman Sachs failure that they reacted to quickly by killing Lehman and saving Goldman Sachs. But the point is we have a slight order of magnitude greater subprime problem now with shale oil. $2 trillion worth of energy company bonds that are all, in a sense, underwater, that are all in deep trouble right now. Combine that subprime problem in the energy sector with, say, car loans that are subprime. They're doing seven-year loans. As soon as they drive the car out of the lot, they're in negative equity. You, you can't do that. You don't have that phenomenon with a four-year car loan. Then there's a third area of subprime, and it's about a $2 trillion student loan subprime problem. They're not finding jobs. So they're carrying debt, not finding jobs. So with the student loans, the car loans, and the shale oil bond problem, we're ready for the next big layman type event. So this is what 2015 is bringing in store, and I'd like to just make a simple point regarding 2015 and the fractures. The petrodollar is dead. The linkage between oil and the dollar is no longer tight. It's no longer being managed effectively with the Saudi output and contributions. The effect is being seen in a falling oil price. It sounds backwards. And in a sense, it is backwards. It's a paradox. But what ties these markets together is not actual oil sales and purchase of a treasury bond. That's not it. No, that's the surface appearance. And it's not correct. Behind the scenes are a mountain of derivatives, forex derivatives that link through paper contracts, the oil price, with the treasury bond, with the dollar. And that device, those that mountain of derivatives, is all being eroded away. And the effect is lost control. This is the systemic breakdown. The oil price is the, the effect on the tangible markets, the tangible economy, that will bring about fractures in much the same way like a parallel to the last four years, five years since Lehman has shown and displayed and exposed the insolvency of banks. So before you had insolvency of banks with patchwork of bond rescues, government rescues, stimulus, QE, which is not stimulus, 
And all that was to prevent the failure of the financial sector. Now it's going to be interesting to watch the, the response to the failure of the tangible economy. I've got a quote. It, it's from my own words, but it, it has to do with QE and the bond monetization. They're printing money to cover U.S. government debt because 90% of it is not saleable. The global investors don't want it. This is what a third world nation does. They print money to cover their own debt. Some people think that it's, it's a, a good practice to do, but it has consequences. And I'd like to just you know, read my own quote to close out the answer to this. Um, the United States has been eating ants, fleas, and termites for over 40 years. But for the last four years, the Federal Reserve has been injecting insecticide into the U.S. body economic throat, calling it treatment to kill the insects. This is what they label as stimulus. It will instead kill the patient in a long, slow, certain death through poisoning. The treatment is killing capital. This is what we're doing as policy. This is insane. It's, it's suicidal. It's very temporary. The only stimulus you get from QE, Elijah, is that they cover the debt. Okay, they cover the debt. Well, what's the consequence? The consequence is that the whole world is, is doing a hedge exercise against the new money injection in the dollar terms, and that brings about higher costs. Well, that was the case for about two or three years. Now we're seeing a climax where it broke the system. And it broke the system with the petrodollar. The petrodollar is coming apart, and the effect is seen in a falling oil price, which will wreck the oil industry. Not just the shale. That's the marginal. In fact, here's a statistic that's shocking. Since 2007, of all world output I should say global, all earthbound, <laughs> all earth global energy oil production, of all that production, 87% of new output has been from shale. So I believe the Chinese and the Saudis are attacking the largely U.S. and EU, European and American, shale oil marginal output business. That's what I think is going on. You mentioned that the dollar will rise, rise, rise again, and then finally collapse. So while the dollar is rising, do you see this hurting the United States at all because the United States exports will cost more to other countries? Yes. Simply stated, as the dollar is rising, it makes export the whole export industry more difficult for the United States. Now that means if there's a machine tool business in Michigan or Illinois, they're going to have a harder time exporting. They're going to have a harder time competing against the Japanese whose currency is declining. Okay, but this is much deeper than that. What it means is that there are very few foreign buyers of U.S. stocks. So, you've got QE that was supposedly just to be to cover U.S. government debt. Now they're having to ex uh, what's the word? exercise, devote some of the printed money. They're having to devote it toward U.S. stocks because foreign buyers have gone away. Furthermore, f foreign buyers of U.S. property are going away, except for the Chinese who are very busy buying up commercial property. And here's a device that I heard about uh, a few months ago. It's, it's still a relevant story because it's, it's, it's important and it's kind of entertaining. The Chinese are trying to convert their treasury bonds into tangible assets, whether it's, you know, more port facilities in Canada or Australia or, or Western Africa, or whether it's energy deposits or petrochemical plant in Saudi Arabia, but they're trying to dump their treasury bonds and trying to convert into hard assets. 
They're buying farmland. They're buying a, a lot of uh, hay fields. Um, they, they'll buy a they'll buy a farm that that makes alfalfa hay, and then afterwards, one third of the output goes to China for their livestock feed. Okay, this is part of the the Chinese dumping of treasury bond effect. Now, if they di if they divert farm output like hay, I think this is a trial to see what the U.S. response will be. So far, there's nothing because Americans are asleep at the wheel watching Ferguson, watching other events of a social nature, and watching, you know, television stupid shows. Americans are not paying attention. The Chinese are doing something very clever. They put up, say, $10 billion, billion with a B as in boy, and they put it in on deposit at Wells Fargo, their favorite bank in California. Their favorite bank, period. But it is located in California. With that $10 billion, Wells Fargo puts up a credit line of something like $70 billion. And with that $70 billion, China goes out and purchases more Manhattan property, more Los Angeles and San Francisco property, and even some, say, Dallas and Chicago property. And the U.S. government doesn't like it, and they reprimand Wells Fargo. But here's where it's humorous. What are they going to tell Wells Fargo? Don't accept treasury bonds as collateral? <laughs> I mean, this is comical what's going on. So China says, no, we're going to continue because your banking system honors treasury bonds as what they call pristine, the highest quality of collateral. I mean, the, the, the breakdown points are everywhere. They're numerous. They're countless. You mentioned in your article that once we see these fractures starting, there's going to be calls for a new gold standard. I know we've talked about this gold standard before. You see calls for that coming in 2015? Yes, I think so. Um, take a look at the past treatments for, for crises. Um, back in 2008, we had the U.S. government stimulus. We had uh, calls and a movement for financial regulation, which, which Citigroup completely, completely took over. So, in other words, the banking industry wrote the regulations for reform. Um, then you had QE after the move to 0%. 0% means you've got a dead level EKG on your heart, a flat line. So then we came out with the bond monetization reluctantly. Uh, Greenspan is on record as saying that whenever you have bond monetization of unsterilized type, and once again, you get, might have some listeners here don't know what is meant by unsterilized. If you want to have a safer version of printing money and injecting it, then you buy the treasury bonds, but you remove an equal volume, say, for commercial credit, or you remove an equal volume, say, for other credit in other purposes like defense industry or, you know, highway construction. You remove it from one, you add it to the other, you have a net zero effect on the increase to the money supply. We didn't do that. We didn't do that. In fact, the United States is now seeing a fourfold increase in the money supply in the last few years and a 50% decline in the money velocity. That's a systemic breakdown point of fact, a piece of evidence. The Europeans follow suit by bringing on dollar swap facilities. In 2011 and 12, they tapped into $2.3 trillion in fresh money creation to try to help their sovereign bond problem for Southern Europe. Didn't work. Didn't fix it. They may have a reduced bond yield on, say, Portuguese bonds and other bonds like in Italy and, and Spain, but the economies are fractured now. The, the labor market's in ruins. They got 20% unemployment. Didn't fix anything. Then the Draghi, <coughs> pardon me, then the Draghi Euro Central Bank went about with these LT. FO, long-term finance operation bonds. 
that have been declared illegal by the Supreme Court of Germany. Those bonds actually purported to be senior, in other words, have higher seniority during failure than government sovereign bonds, and it was done so by decree. Th these are not measures to fix anything. So you've got patchwork, you've got printed money. The U.S. recently said we're going to stop the QE, bond monetization, but the same week the Japanese announced that they're going to have unlimited bond monetization because quietly the United States commandeered the Japanese government pension fund worth $1.2 trillion. So we're not fixing anything. We're doing shell games and patches with war, war and more war to cause de destabilization where we steal their gold. The U.S. stole the Libyan gold. They stole the gold in Tunisia. They tried to steal the gold in Egypt. Didn't work. We've been stealing Arab gold in the Swiss banks for the last two or three years. Then we stole the Ukraine gold two weeks after the coup d'etat, which the United States spent five billion on executing. American public doesn't see it that way. I've got a brother who usually is well informed, but he said, you know, that Putin's a real prick. And I said, I don't think you know anything about Putin. I don't think you know anything about Ukraine. I don't think you know anything about the war. I don't think you know anything about the gas pipelines. I don't think you know anything about the European Union. I don't think you know anything about the sanctions. And he said, wow. And I said, prove me wrong. In the next 30 seconds, he did not prove me wrong. Americans don't know anything about anything when it comes to Europe and the Ukraine war, period. So as you have these crises and the patches and the shell game and the war-based thefts of gold, the economies are cratering while the banks remain insolvent. And now you've got a new phenomenon of a falling oil price and fractures in the very tangible energy industry. While the U.S. is ordering Exxon and the other U.S. and Western-based oil giants not to participate in some of the new energy projects of Russia, whether they're Siberian-based or Arctic Circle-based or Pacific-based near Sakhalin Peninsula. So with this breakdown in the oil industry, and the breakdown in the derivatives from the fractured and broken dead petrodollar, and the continuing insolvency of the banking structures, there's going to be a very loud outcry to join the BRICS alliance, to join the BRICS movement. They've got a number of different funds. They've, they've got, uh, oh, I have the names just here. Hang on. <clears throat> they've, got, they've got funds. They've got the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, AIIB. They have the New Development Bank, the NDB. I call that the BRICS Development Bank, the fund, BRICS Development Fund. They have a Contingency Reserve Arrangement, the CRA, for crisis management in case of a hot money run on their bond market or stock market or currency. And now a new one. Just got $40 billion in funding from China. The Silk Road Fund. That's going to connect... Asia to both Europe and the Arab world. So there's going to be a loud cry from even Western nations. We need to join the BRICS movement toward the return of the gold standard. This is what I believe is going to start and gain a lot of momentum in this calendar year. The breakdowns are going to continue. They're going to amplify. They're going to accelerate. And the outcry for a solution, a real, viable, bona fide, legitimate solution is going to be understood and proclaimed to be gold-based. We've pissed around and wrecked the gold, the global economy by not installing gold as a currency standard. I'd like to point out, Elijah, that I came to learn a little while ago, a few months ago, 
that in the end of 2013, in January of 2014, there was a global currency reset, kind of a treaty, a financial accord, a pact. It was signed by something like 117 nations, including the United States. It was to rejigger the currencies among themselves, but also, very importantly, to double the gold price and triple the silver price. That was what the current, the global currency reset was all about, changing the gold price relative to all the shit paper fiat currencies, like the dollar, the British pound, the euro, the Swiss franc, the yen. Adjust the currencies versus themselves, but more importantly, against gold. Why didn't they call that the, the gold standard reinstallation pact? Instead, it's the global currency reset. What it implied <clears throat> was that gold is a currency. And that went right over the head of most Western people, completely over the head of U.S. citizens. So, Instead of following through in January of 2014 with the currency reset as an international treaty, the U.S. once again violated the treaty and triggered the Ukraine war. The U.S. is now seen widely across the world as a rogue nation. The rogue nation is not Iran. It's widely recognized increasingly even among Western European nations as being the United States. The United States is the rogue nation. We're the warmongering nation that refuses to let trade continue and develop between Russia and Europe. We're the rogue nation that's polluting the world with printed dollars. And what's the primary purpose where printed dollars go related to QE? To bail out Wall Street banks which are holding mortgage bonds and treasury bonds. It's now shoved into the U.S. Fed balance sheet, the central bank at the Fed, Federal Reserve. And I hear reports more and more and more Chinese own controlling interest now of the Federal Reserve. So loaded up with four times the balance sheet full of toxic U.S. government bonds and then sell it to the Chinese. Wow. We're coming to the climax, and I think the, the dying petrodollar seen in a falling oil price is evidence that we're coming toward a conclusion here, or at least loud outcry for a different approach besides more debt and more patches to fix too much debt and torn up patches. There was a hint about a year ago when the Brent crude oil price converged. It lost its $15 to $20 premium. The Brent crude oil price converged with the West Texas U.S.-based price. And I put out word to my own kind of a staff, a quasi-staff. It's the brain trust. It's a bunch of uh, colleagues who are really bright, and we try to figure out a lot of things. And I think we do successfully. It's borne out in, in a lot of correct forecasts in, in the Hattrick Letter newsletter. Anyway, the conclusion that, that we came to, especially from Euro Raj, a London banker, excellent London banker, uh, <clears throat> Euro Raj told me outright in the middle of 2013, late 2013, he said, as the Brent and Texas price of oil converge, it's evidence that the petrodollar is soon to be dead. Wow. Okay, I think we're seeing it. Pardon me. I think we're seeing evidence of the broken petrodollar. Think of them as large cables to hold up a bridge, like in a suspension bridge. You've got these big cables that are maybe two inches in diameter or bigger, you know, strands that are all coiled together. That cable line holding together the dollar with the, the, the quasi-oil standard. We got rid of the gold standard in 1971. And then in 1973, we put up the petrodollar standard, which was a quasi-linkage between the dollar and crude oil. And we did that so that we could control the Middle East and force recycled petro-surplus dollars, 
back into U.S. Treasuries, and we betrayed that treaty also with the Saudis and the Emirates and the Persian Gulf. We betrayed them because we're stealing their gold in Swiss banks. We're in the end game and soon game over for the dollar. That's my conclusion, Elijah. This video was brought to you by ReluctantPreppers.com. Click here to listen to Reluctant Preppers' latest interview with Jim Willie, where Jim Willie outlines the seismic shift that has been ongoing for decades away from the U.S. dollar, accelerating in recent years and months across the globe. Willie spells out how the dying dollar threatens the average family and what you can do to prepare and protect yourself. Click here to subscribe for free to financeandliberty.com and also our sponsor, ReluctantPreppers.com, helping you be aware and prepared.